studio. Joining me are Dr. John Nunn and Dr. Jonathan Mestel. They played in the first quarter final, and I'd like to invite them to go through the game. Thank you, Ray. I decided to start with my usual opening first move, E4. Well, this was no surprise, and I decided to play my usual dragon variation of the Sicilian. So, the next move is standard, knight f3. I continue. d4. The first few moves are quite routine. Both of us are expecting. Recapture with the knight. Develop the knight, attacking his centre pawn. Defending the pawn and giving him the choice of a number of different variations to play, but I expect him to play his usual dragon variation. Well, I expected that he was expecting it. But I play the characteristic move of the dragon. Could I, could I interject, a, interject a concept here? We're saying it's this Sicilian defence dragon variation. It's a very exciting name, the dragon variation. Why is it called the dragon variation? Well, it's characterised by Black's development of his king's bishop onto this square, g7. And this leads to a very fiery play. But I think it really derives its name from this pawn structure, which is held by some to resemble a dragon. Oh, well, that's a very convincing explanation. <laughs> so what happened now? Well, now I uh, decided to play one of the sharpest lines against the dragon, the so-called Yugoslav attack. Uh, I'd spent uh, quite a lot of time preparing for this game by looking at a number of uh, uh, recent Grandmaster encounters in the Yugoslav attack. So I'm hoping that uh, this pre-game preparation will help me today. Bishop e3. Looks like he's going to castle queenside. Oh, well, that should make it exciting. When uh, we were younger, I consistently played this Yugoslav attack against Jonathan, and I lost almost every game. Uh, but in recent years, I've managed to get one of these losses back. So perhaps I'll manage to uh, repeat this again today. F3. Yes, as expected, he's adopting the aggressive formation. Well, I shall castle kingside and await the attack. White's plan in this variation is to consolidate his centre and then to launch a vigorous kingside attack, probably by means of the advance of the h-pawn. Of course, if you're going to do that kind of thing, you have to uh, put your king somewhere safe, and normally the white king goes to the queen side, although, to tell the truth, this often proves to be not so safe after all, since black often gets a very strong counter-attack. So it's really... Uh, often a race between the two attacks in this variation, white on the king's side and black on the queen's side. Queen d2. Well, I'll continue developing my queen side pieces, my knight to c6. There are two possible systems for white here. White can either play castle's queen side immediately, but this allows black to play d5 if he wants to. The alternative is to prevent the d5 move by playing bishop c4. Yes, well, I'll continue developing. I wonder what he's going to play next move. If he moves his h-pawn, I think I might try something new. There are two possible move orders here for white. White can either play castle's queen side or h4. Both of these moves are typical of white's system, and they often transpose into each other. But according to which move white plays, black has diff uh, different options for avoiding the main line. So it's a question of trying to anticipate whether or not Jonathan is going to play something out of the ordinary and to choose either h4 or castle's queenside to, to stop what he might be planning to play. But since I can't read his mind, uh, this is largely a matter of guesswork. So in a typical uh, piece of uh, rigorous chess thinking, I'll go uh, eeny, meeny, miny, h4. Let me ask a question, John. Um, you seem to be talking all the time about a possibility of attack against the Black King. But uh, to many inexperienced players, it might seem that uh, the Black King is very safe indeed. It's tucked behind a, a forest of pawns. The bishop on g7 and the knight on f6 are, are busy defending it. It seems to be surrounded by its own pieces. And if you look at your army, it's really bunched in the centre. So what makes you think you've got a good chance of attacking the Black King? It's true that Black does have two good pieces defending the king. But on the other hand, I can prize open the h-file for my rook by pushing the pawn onto h5 even if this involves sacrificing a pawn. Also, I can often eliminate the defensive bishop on g7 by bishop h6, and sometimes I can get rid of the knight on f6 as well by knight d5. So although there are a number of defensive uh, barriers in my way, uh, there's nothing 
there's no fundamental reason why I can't get rid of most of them and really get to grips with Black's King. Yeah, let me ask you another question before we proceed. Um, I don't want to go into too detailed variations, but you've just played this move, pawn to h4, and obviously you're trying to ram this pawn down as a sort of battering ram down Black's throat. But let's just look at one possible move for Black. Let's say he moved his h-pawn from h7 to h5 and just blocked your attack in its tracks. I mean, what sort of moves would you be thinking of to proceed then with the attack? Well, that is a, a standard possibility in this position. I mean, my immediate reply would be Castle's queenside. Uh, but in the long term, I would have to alter my plans somewhat and try to open up lines by playing the move g4, oh, right, even, so if, even if this involves some kind of sacrifice. So although h5 temporarily blocks uh, the king's side, if I f do finally get to play g4, then my, my attack will be even stronger than it is at the right, moment. So what you're saying is that you're so confident that uh, white's chances lie on the king's side rather than the queen's side or the centre, that even if black tried to block, physically block your advance, you could sacrifice pieces or pawns over there and try and blast through. Well, I could try. Right. Well, he'll be expecting me to play h5 here, but I've prepared a, an idea involving a pawn sacrifice, but first I have to swap knights in the centre. Now, this is an unusual move. <clears throat> I can't think of any games where Jonathan has played this knight exchange. I was looking at a game this morning in which uh, Black adopted this idea. He followed it up by playing b5. I wonder if that's what Jonathan intends to do. What was that game, by the way? It was a game uh, of Scherzer against Pettersson uh, from one of these big American Swiss tournaments oh, it was the last US, year. US Open in 1986, I think. I was, it was 87, I, it, but I think it was Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, White won this game in spectacular style, but uh, I wouldn't expect Jonathan to play exactly the same way. Anyhow, I've got uh, no choice here. I have to recapture the knight. And now I'll play this pawn sacrifice. I wonder if he's seen it before. So, Jonathan, before we, we go on to White's reply to this, um, you're offering a pawn on the, uh, on the queen side. Um, is this a standard sort of ploy in this, in this dragon variation? Does Black... Is the, we've, uh, we've seen that White is attacking on the king's side and you're offering material to shift the balance of struggle to the other side of the board. Is this, is this normal or is this something you've cooked up for this game? No, it's not my idea. I've seen it played by the Icelandic Grandmaster Pettersson. Uh, if, if he doesn't take the pawn, then my attack on the queen's side is, will be even faster than it normally is because I'll then move my other pawn to a5. And if he does, well... He can only take it with the bishop if he takes it with the knight. Um, there's a tactic that's good for me. But then, then we'll see. I get some, t some aggressive play against the centre and queen side. Right, so you're hoping that white will retreat his bishop and then you're going to roll forward your pawns on the, uh, on the queen side of the board? I'm hoping he won't know how to react and this will come as a surprise to him. And uh, you said that uh, uh, you've seen this idea played before. I mean, it, for most people watching this programme, uh, this position will be utterly new. Um, it'll be you know, amazing to them that a position that um, appears so far into the middle game um, is actually well mapped already and the grandmasters of your strength are aware of precedence uh, in, in, in this kind of position. And so opening theory, the theory of openings, the study of openings really goes a long way into the middle game for players of your strength. It goes a lot further than this and I'm, I hope that I, that I know as much about this position as Dr Nunn does but we'll see. Well, uh I believe that uh, the initiative is extremely important in these quick play games, so I don't really want to accept this pawn sacrifice. Although, possibly in a, uh, a slower game, I might be prepared to uh, take Jonathan on in it. But in, I, I think I'll just retreat the bishop. This was the move played in the scherzer Pettersen game, and it kind of transposes to uh, a variation which was uh, briefly popular uh, some years ago. So, bishop b3. He played that very quickly, that was a bit to my surprise. Nevertheless, I'll continue with my plan. Well, this is an interesting moment because uh, this position has occurred a number of times and White usually advances either his A-pawn or his H-pawn in this position. But uh, Scherzer came up with this very interesting idea of ignoring the advance of the black pawns on the queen side and trying to uh, go for this elimination of the defensive black pieces on F6 and G7. Well, I think I'll try it out. It's possible, even if Jonathan uh, has looked at this variation, he won't know this particular game. So I'll play knight d5. That's a bit of a surprise. I remember looking at this a while ago, but I didn't think it was very good for white. 
Um, could you ju not just take that knight off? And it's a very aggressively posted knight in the centre of the board. It's jumped into your position. He's playing into your half. Couldn't you just take it off and try and reduce White's initiative a bit? Well, I could, but the whole point of my play is to try and make his bishop on b3 um, a target for attack, and that would have given the opportunity to recapture with that bishop attacking my rook. Oh, right. So what you want to do is you've started launching these queenside pawns forward, and you want to carry on hunting down his bishop on the b3 square? Yes. I think I'm... There, there are a number of moves I could play, but I'm going to play the one that gives me the best chance for an advantage. I'm going to try and trap that bishop on b3 by attacking the d5 square with my pawn. Well, that was the move Pettison played as well. It seems I'm really fully committed now. I have to play the sacrificial uh, variation which uh, Scherzer played in this, this uh, game from last year. I'm a bit worried that perhaps uh, Jonathan has analysed the concept and found a, a major flaw in it but uh, balanced against that is the chance that he hasn't seen the game at all. But in any case, I'm committed now. I have to go through with this and hope that the whole thing works out. Bishop b6. Well, this is a very risky continuation for him. He's going to have to put his pieces on rather odd squares. I'll play the most aggressive reply, I think, bringing my queen to that black diagonal. Yes, that move is forced, and I'm committed now, not only uh, is my knight on d5 attacked, but my bishop on b6 is hanging, and bishop on b3 is about to be trapped by a4. So I have to continue with forcing moves. So I'll attack his queen with bishop c7. Yes, as I expected. And I'll put my queen on that diagonal. One day it may get to g1, you never know. These queens on squares like a7, uh, you tend to be uh, a little careless sometimes and allow them to suddenly leap in at uh, g1 or e3 or somewhere. So I shall have to constantly bear in mind uh, that the queen uh, is quite active on this a7 to g1 diagonal. Anyhow, I, uh, as I say, the whole continuation is, is forced for a few moves, so I just have to go in and uh, hope that it all turns out well. Knight e7 check. Yes, I was expecting that. My reply is forced. And bishop takes d6. So you've won a pawn now, John? <laughs> well, I've won a pawn, but he now has the opportunity to trap the bishop on b3, and I'm sure he'll do this because it's the... Uh, only way to justify his pawn sacrifice. Right, but correct me if I'm wrong, this is still along the lines you'd foreseen almost before the game, is that right? Yeah, precisely. That's really amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, I'll continue now trapping this bishop. More relevantly, it means that he'll find it very difficult to castle queenside now. Or my queen and rook on the A-file will be very strong. So, in a sense now, Jonathan, what you've been trying to achieve, you have, in fact, achieved. You've pushed the queenside pawns forwards, you're attacking the white bishop on B3, and if we look around for squares for it to escape to, in fact, there aren't any at all. It's, it's completely hunted down, and you've done what you've set out to achieve. The problem is, of course, that your king has uh, been pushed to the edge of the board on uh, h8, and uh, several of the white pieces are gravitating towards it. So there might be some counterattack going on there. Oh, yes, it's a very sharp position, and we've both headed for it. Just have to see what happens. Now, the bishop on b3 is trapped. There's no escape route for it, but uh, now it's my turn to... Uh, start a counter-attack on the king's side. And in this I'm helped by the good position of the knight on e7, which pins the black king down to the uh, rather risky h-file. Well, I'll just... I'm still following the scherzer Pettersen game, so I'll just go ahead. Uh, one uh, good point about it is that at least there are several opportunities for, for black to uh, waste time making difficult decisions, so that even if something goes wrong in the tactics, I might still be able to win the game uh, on the time factor. h5. Yes, that's the only move. Now, his real threat is to go h6 and eliminate my black squared bishop, so I have to take that pawn with something. Taking with the knight, well, it's very complicated. I could then block his attack down the h-file. I think I'm going to play the sharper move and take with the pawn. Yes, uh, Jonathan's <laughs> playing all Pettison's moves. Well, now Scherz have played e5, and I remember seeing a brief note which just said that the reply at knight e8, which was actually played by Pettison, was a mistake. I presume this means that the annotator thought that the correct reply to e5 would be knight g8. I think in this case I would have to uh, sacrifice a piece and hope for the best. But uh, who knows, perhaps Jonathan will continue to uh, follow Pettersen's moves and play the erroneous knight retreat to e8, e5. Well, I just don't believe this attack for white. 
I, he can't yet take the h-pawn because my queen comes within to g1 and he can't castle queenside because then pawn takes bishop is very strong. I could move my knight to either of two squares eliminating one or other of his bishop and knight. Knight g8 is safer but I, I just don't believe this. I think knight e8 is going to win. And for the first time I'm feeling confident in this game because now Scherzer played uh, the unexpected move castles queenside with the idea of uh, battering the attack through down the h-file with rook takes h5 and then a sacrifice on h7. It seems clear from the amount of time that Jonathan's taking, taken so far that he doesn't know this previous game and so it's not likely that he'll have some stunning improvement prepared. Of course I must be careful not to play my moves in the other order. I can't play rook takes h5 first because of queen g1 check. That would be a horrible accident. It would be extremely unpleasant. Um, but I think Castle's queenside gives White a decisive attack. He doesn't have time to take on b3 because after rook takes h5, the, the attack blasts down the h-file successfully. So what can he do? Yes, Castle's queenside. So this is what we might say is a, a typical structural position from the Dragon Sicilian, that uh, Black has played all his trumps on the queenside and has... Uh, obviously got a powerful counter-attack going against your king and on the other side of the board you're trying to smash him on the uh, on the h-file isn't completely open yet but at the bottom of that h-file is the black king and if you can rip away the two pawns in front of the black king you're going to give checkmate very exciting position the dragon isn't it and you always have these do or die struggles leading to battles on the edge of a precipice yes of course it's a very sharp position and it's not really a characteristic dragon position because white doesn't normally implant his knight e7 in the dragon yes uh, i was but talking you're, but you're right in the sense that the kingside v queenside theme is uh, very normal for this opening yes well this move came as a big shock to me but now that i think about it i see it it's very sensible if i take on the bishop on b3 he's going to take on h5 and I can't take on a2 because he then plays rook takes h7 check. So what you're worried about, Jonathan, is in fact that white is uh, sacrificing many pieces, but uh, he's ultimately going to break through and get at your king on the, uh, on the h-file. I'm worried about being checkmated in this position. I mean, I've got a very good position if I can survive four moves. Mm -hmm. But the more I look at this, the more I realise it's very difficult to do so. I, I have to eliminate that knight on e7 somehow uh, in order to give my king a flight square. I'm beginning to think I should have put that knight on g8. Never mind, I will eliminate it by moving my knight round to f5. Who knows, he may even recapture this bishop if he's not thinking. This, this knight that I've just taken his bishop with. Yes, still following the Shears of Pettersen game. Well, of course, I mustn't waste time now recapturing this knight on d6. Uh, the, the attack down the h-file is the uh, only important factor. Uh, if the attack fails, I'm completely lost, but if it succeeds, I'll probably deliver mate. So rook takes h5. Yes, and now I have to put my knight on f5 to guard this h6 square, otherwise he'll play rook takes h7 check and make me. Well, uh, what's the position like now? And you're, uh, you're actually a piece down now, Johnny, is that right? Yes, that's right. And the, uh, the bishop on uh, b3 is uh, still trapped. Black can uh, take that almost whenever he likes and yet uh, you're still looking fairly confident? Well, first of all, I'm still following this game, which White won in a few moves from this position, uh, with no improvements being suggested for Black. Yeah, that's interesting. I think we've played 21 moves of this game so far, mm -hmm. and you're still following a game that's already been played, which presumably you know about, and it's becoming clear that uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Messel doesn't know about. And it's just such an amazing illustration of the... Uh, amount of knowledge that modern grandmasters require. And where do, where do you get this, uh, this information from? Is it back books or magazines or and have you got a, a telex set up in your house where the moves are coming in uh, by the hour? Oh, look, various sources, books, magazines. Um, uh, now you can get games uh, on computer. Uh, but it just goes to show that, as in any other sport, uh, most of the time you spend at chess is in training and preparation rather than actually playing over the board. Information gathering. Yes. So I mean, chess is, in fact, a, an extremely good example of an information-intensive sport. It certainly is, yes. Yes. Well, anyhow, um, I've taken my h5, so we'll just see what he's going to do next. It's your move. So it is. <laughs> In that case, I'll eliminate the knight. Knight takes f5. Yes, we're still threatening to take on h7 with check, so I have to retake. I think it's probably worth trying to work out 
my defence now. But um, the more I look at this, the more I realise I haven't got a defence as such. And this is a rather unfortunate state of affairs. Oh, well. I'm you have to take the knight, I suppose. There's no choice with that. Well, if I take the bishop, he plays rook takes h7 check, and then rook to h1 check. And, and this then, looks very dangerous. Well, it's, his knight goes to e7 mate. Yes. It's very dangerous. So, so, th so that, that knight on f5 is the, uh, the most dangerous piece. You've got to eliminate it quickly as possible. Yes, but I don't like the way things are looking. I'll recapture for the moment. Oh, I can't see any defence uh, for black now if I just double rooks on the h file. I'm threatening mate in three with rook takes h7 check and rook takes g7 check. And I suppose the crucial point is that if he plays queen to a6 or b6, then I just play rook takes h7 check and queen g5. And he can't interpose his queen on g6 because that bishop on b3, which has been hanging on prise for a long time now, um, means that the pawn on f7 isn't really defending the queen. Yes, uh, I think it must be all over. The, the very worst that's going to happen is that, uh, well, the very best from his point of view is that I'll get something like a queen and a lot of pawns for rook and a piece. So, doubles rooks. Yes, it's so easy for him now. What's the trouble? Well, I'll move my king and see what, that, what to play next move. Well, this uh, change of move order doesn't make any difference. I'll just take the pawn on h7. Impressive column of rooks you have on the open h file, John. Yes, it's the fact that the queen can swing in as well, which is the deciding factor. Well, I suspect my best move is queen g1 check now, and then I, after some simplification I'll have rook and bishop against queen and several pawns that's not really any chance at all I think my best chance is to set him a min minor trap I'll after queen b6 e6 wins very easily but maybe he'll play queen g5 and I think I have a defense after that well this is the first new move of the game I think Betterson played f4 but it didn't make any difference because this position is completely lost for black in any case now it's, it's really straightforward, as I said before, just queen g5, he can't play queen g6 because the f-pawn is pinned by the bishop. So he'll have to give up his queen under even worse circumstances than last move. Queen g5. Oh, good. Now I play queen g6. He's probably playing queen h4, thinking he's mating me on h8, but then I can play bishop takes e5, and maybe the game continues. Trouble is, he can take that queen on g6 if I play it there. You'd overlook the pin. Completely. Oh dear. I thought that bishop on b3 was dead. All right, so things are looking grim, eh? Yes, I think I should really reside now. But I'll play a few more checks. One more check. This is a sort of computer move, delaying, <laughs> delaying mate by, uh, by a very short time, even at the cost of giving up the queen. Well, I'll take it off. Yes, not long to go now. Well, unfortunately, my attack is undiminished, so uh, it's going to be mate in any case. I'll put the rook back on the h-file. Yes. False reply. Bishop on b3 is still useful uh, after I play queen h5, threatening queen h7 mate. The only way to prevent that mate is to move the rook away from f8. But then, with the bishop on b3 supporting the queen, I can take the pawn on f7 instead, and it's again mate. So it's going to be mate anyway. No computer moves this time. Queen h5. Well, I could play bishop h6 check, stopping the mate one move, but I think I'll resign. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. That was, that was a, a truly wonderful game. Um, we've seen how Dr John Nunn beat Dr Jonathan Mestel. Join us after the break to see in detail where the game was won and lost. Welcome back to the James Capel Speed Chess Challenge. Now Dr John Nunn and Dr Jonathan Mestel will take a look at the decisive moments of the game. But before we start, John, you're an expert at speed chess. You won the uh, championship last year. Can you just tell us very briefly what qualities are required for success at this game? Um, well, strong nerves, obviously, because you, you don't have time to uh, hesitate when you're playing with only 25 minutes for all your moves. And secondly, I think a different kind of style is important. I think uh, having the initiative is extremely important. It's much more difficult to play defensive moves uh, quickly than it is to play attacking moves. Right. Well, you certainly got the initiative in this game. And now this is the position, and uh, this is just after you've played this very initiative-seeking move, uh, thrusting the pawn up to h5, is that right? Yes. And, uh, Jonathan, you, you took the, uh, that with your pawn? Yes. I'm still not sure whether that was uh, 
a mistake or not. Right, well, let's take let's, a look at the alternative. alternative. Yes, the obvious move is to take with the knight. That's how one would normally play in this position. Yes. You would have played g4. I would have played g4 mm. with, well, the main point being that if the knight goes back to f6, then I would play bishop to e5 with the extremely strong threat of taking on f6 and then after recaptures uh, queen h6, which would uh, force mate. Well, can I just add something to that? Yes. I, uh, I, will, I did look at this briefly, in fact, and if I take here, for example, and you play your idea, yes. I can play bishop to h4 check, which is a sneaky move. But it's not good enough. If you well, take if the, I take with the rook... Yes, and then that, that wins, of course. I mean, yes. I get my check. You get two checks. And another check, but then... Yes. But then what? Indeed. That no more checks. No more checks. Fascinating variation. Yes, well, but also it would give me a draw at best, so at this stage I wasn't interested in right. a draw. So let's go back to the, uh, the key starting position again. Yes, I assume that after g4 you would play... I'll take the bishop. ...to play some other move. So it's black's move in this position. Yes. yes. Well, I, I also vaguely looked at this. Of course, one doesn't have time to think. Yes, I take. And then to take here. At the time, I was afraid of c3. To c3, this, this move. Yes. Um, hang on, no, sorry. I'm getting confused. I'm very getting very confused, excuse me. I think it's important that I should play g5 in this position to stop you opening the h file. Yes, I mean, the, the threat to take twice on g6 or to take and play queen h2 in some positions must be very strong. So I was thinking of g5, and then I was most worried by h6, and then after I take here, then to play c3. And the point of this is that the uh, defensive bishop is locked off from the, uh, the king side, is that right? Yes, if, for example, I were to play bishop takes rook. Which most people would in some situations. Well, <laughs> maybe. But then white can play check. Yes. I must play f6, and then he can take here. And that exploits the pin. The, uh, the pawn can't take the queen because the bishop would uh, be attacking the black king. That's a wonderful variation. But I mean, is this variation completely clear if you play queen e3 check and then take, take the bishop? Maybe not. You then go back to g5. Can I defend? Uh, perhaps not, no. No, once the, yes, of course, once the pawn is blocking, you can't come back by taking on c3. So I mean, the conclusion really is that if you take on h5 with the, with the knight instead of the pawn, white side is a very dangerous attack. Well, it's dangerous, but it's dangerous for white as well. Yeah. And my problem was that I just had to decide what, yes. which of these lines offered the best chances. And, very uh, difficult in the practical game. Now, you said that there was another uh, key moment later on where you had an important choice. Can we go back to the game continuation yes. and follow it up to, up to that moment? Do we have the position right? Is that yes, correct? yes, that's right. But it's only one move further on. Yes. Right, I, I took, took the, the pawn. pawn and then right. I played e5. Right, and in the game now, Jonathan, you, you, uh, you put the knight back to uh, e8. Is yes, that right? yes, there seems to be no defence after that right. move. And, I'm, uh, not, I'm not convinced I, I played more than one bad move in this game. Right. I, and this was certainly it, if there yeah. was only one. So, I mean, the alternative, <laughs> really, yeah. is to, um, as you said to, uh, beforehand, is to, is to put the knight back to g8. Indeed to challenge the, uh, that dangerous white knight on e7, which was really the, the whole bane of your existence afterwards. Can we just take a look at that? And see what happened yes, after indeed. Nigeria? Well, I don't think I can deliver mate after this move because there are too many defensive pieces on the king's side. I think I'd have to uh, sacrifice this knight to save the bishop on b3. Yes, well, I don't think I can let you take my black squared bishop, so I would have to take that. And now the bishop can come out and both black rooks are attacked and the pawn on h5 seems doomed. So I would guess the most likely upshot would be that I'll get a rook and a pawn against two minor pieces. I think I'd, looking at this after the game, I think I'd be happy with this position. I'd maybe play to attack the e-pawn, something like that. Or maybe play to swap off one of your bishops. I don't know. I suppose I would castle in this case. Can I take this, then? Well, that looks like uh, the critical continuation. I uh, certainly, uh, it looks okay for you if you keep your black square bishop. That's going to be the real problem. But, uh, well, can I, can I take this and play for the attack somehow with a, a pin down the diagonal? I don't know. Let me take this. Well, I've got queen to e3, you have to watch. Ah, I see. It looks like white's attack's burning out here to me. 
yes. you're a piece down yes. and Black's pieces are all uh, moving into good defensive positions. So it probably after, instead of Castle's queenside, I might even have to just defend this pawn on e5 by playing f4. Oh, that's interesting. I find it hard to believe, though. Do I maybe get this knight out now? Aha, exploiting the pin. Oh, OK, I'll, I'll take on f8 in this case. I presume you must take that with the bishop. Now you can take on f7, maybe? Well, then knight e4. Mm. Oh, yes, yes. I yes. Guess. Yes, this is... Well, of course, there's still some threats down the h-file. I suppose I castle. Because once this knight's gone, defending h7 might be quite difficult. Well, supposing I continue playing for advantage. And queen takes. Get my queen into the game. Well, I suppose I ought to move my king. Now I've got two bishops for a rook, and I ought to be happy, but maybe I'm not. <laughs> well, let's see if we can start digesting some material. Well, I don't know. What do you think? It's, it's still messy, isn't it? Yes. I think we have to draw a conclusion yes. about this now. I mean, uh, you're saying that uh, knight g8 instead of knight e8 in that critical position is a stronger move. Yes. And I, I think I, you'd agree with that too. Yes. I mean, after that, the position looks quite unclear. Mm-hmm. So this variation of the Dragon Sicilian uh, is still alive, that this kind of position that we have before us, although it didn't occur in the game, the position on the board now, is a possible likely future continuation if you, uh, Jonathan, had played the right move at the right time. Yes, I I'm quite happy with the way the opening went, except that it left me with uh, some difficult decisions to make. Quite At this um, time control, it was very difficult. I think John chose a, a very good line to play at this yeah, time. Yeah, something though. that you hadn't been expecting. I mean, let's just take a brief look at this position on the board in front of us now. This is a, an advanced piece of analysis from what we think would have been the correct move for black. I mean, give me an honest opinion, uh, John. Would you rather be white or black in this position? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very hard to say. I mean, I, Snap decision. Oh, I prefer to be white. And what would you prefer to be? I prefer to be black, but I think it's so far into analysis that it's, it so has no resemblance. Even, even, even after the analysis, yeah. you still prefer the white position, you still prefer indeed. the black position? Yes. Yes. Well, thank you both very much indeed. John Nunn, Jonathan Messel, that was a, a wonderfully exciting and enthralling game. John Nunn beat Jonathan Messel, we've looked at the analysis. Fantastically exciting game. Very well done, both of you. It does great credit to both players, such a fighting game. Now, next week, in the other half of the draw, in the quarter-final, we have the game between John Spielman and Matthew Sadler in the James Capel Speed Chess Challenge. Join us the same time on Thursday next week on Thames for that very exciting game.